wagon, a detective took fingerprints of the deceased. And finally, Patrolman Elton Tyler, the first officer on the scene, made a search of the body, removed all property except clothing, and placed a UF-95 identification tag around the wrist. The body was then removed to the morgue. Meanwhile, detectives of the 21st Squad and the Homicide Squad began the investigation by questioning Mrs. Weald and some of her neighbors. At ten minutes past two in the morning, when all that could be accomplished at the scene of the homicide was done, Lieutenant King ordered Mrs. Weald taken to the station house. As Patrolman Tyler, the arresting officer, and Detective Novak accompanied her to the 21st Squad office on the second floor, Lieutenant King leaned against the filing cabinet and watched them enter. Over here, Mrs. Wheeler. Where? Oh, over here. Do you want me? Yes, that's right. Hello, Tyler. Hello, Lieutenant. We met over at your place, I'm Lieutenant King. Yes, um... Come into my office, please. Novak, Mac, let's go. Yes, sir. Tyler. Yes, sir. Inside, Mrs. Wilk. Just have a seat right there. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Shut the door, Tyler. Yes. Mrs. Wheel, you know you're in serious trouble. I don't care. I really don't care. There are a few things I'd like to get straight. I told you everything I remember. Mrs. Wheel, I'm interested to know how your husband could chase you around the house, threaten to beat you up, threaten to kill you, throw furniture at you, pound on the door... I'd like to know how he could do all these things and be so quiet about it. None of your neighbors on either side of you or upstairs or downstairs heard a thing. How do you account for that? I don't know how to account for it. Well, that racket he was making, chasing you around, threatening you. Seems probable that someone should have heard it, doesn't it? Well, when I fired the shotgun, that made a lot of noise. Nobody heard that either. Oh. They didn't, did they? You didn't find anybody heard that? I'd like you to tell me something else. Yes? When this officer here came up the stairs... When he came up with Sergeant Waters, the door to the bedroom was closed almost all the way. Isn't that right, Tyler? Yes, sir, Lieutenant, that's right. The sergeant had me use my foot to open it the rest of the way. He didn't want me to touch the doorknob. Mrs. Wheel, did you close that door when you came out of the bedroom? I don't know. I don't remember. No, it was closed. It was closed? I must have closed it. Well, Mrs. Wheel, there's something else I'd like to get straight. Please, I'm very tired. It's awfully late. It's the middle of the night. I'm tired, too, Mrs. Wheel. We're all here at this hour on account of you. All right. What I was going to ask about is this. It's not very clear exactly when your husband got home. What time was it? I told you, 11.30, quarter to 12, and he was drunk, very drunk. You're sure it wasn't early? I'm positive. Well, I'm not so positive, Mrs. Wheel. Do you know Mr. Doyle, who lives in your building on the top floor? What's he got to do with it? Mr. Doyle says that he was coming down the stairs. He was on his way out for a paper, and he passed your husband going up. Doyle said that was about 10 o'clock. I don't care what Mr. Doyle says. Mr. Doyle says he distinctly remembers the time. He waited until the end of a radio program before he went out for a paper. Oh, you don't care what Mr. Doyle said. Joe didn't get home till 11.30 or quarter to 12. Besides, what difference does it make? I told you I killed him. There's no argument about that, is there? No. I told you I did it, and I told you why I did it. But I can't understand why nobody heard it. Why nobody heard either the fight or the shot. I mean, they're all deaf. Listen, what about my kids? What happens to them? Is somebody going to go up to the fresh air camp after them? Or maybe they'd better stay there. That would probably be best. Probably. Do you have anyone that could take care of them? No, I've got nobody. Nobody at all. What about your mother-in-law? Did somebody tell her? I've got a detective out trying to locate her. Wasn't she home? I don't know. I haven't heard back from the detective. Well, she should be home. Where else could she go? <gasps> Look, what time is it? It's 2.30 almost. Well, this detective had other things to do. I don't know whether he got to her yet. Oh. This same detective was in a bar and grill down the block from where you live. You know the one I mean? Your husband used to spend a little time in there. I know the one you mean. This detective talked to the bartender. Now, the bartender told him something that checks out, Mr. Doyle, pretty close from the time that your husband got home. The bartender said he remembers your husband left the place about a quarter to ten in the pouring rain, thundering and lightning in the pouring rain. You said he was drunk and nasty, didn't you? He's always drunk and nasty when he comes out of there. Yes, the bartender said something like that, but he said it was quarter to ten. He might have left here at a quarter of ten, but he didn't get home till 11.30 or quarter to twelve. But where did he go for two hours? How should I know where he went? He came home and we got in his fight. I didn't ask him. I didn't care. Please, now, I'm tired. I'm tired of asking questions. I've been asking questions almost all night now. I killed him. I told you I killed him. What else is there to it? There's a lot to it, Mrs. Wheeled. 
Why you killed him is very important. I killed him because he was coming after me. Did you love him? I hated him. I really hated him, but I didn't kill him because I hated him. I killed him because I was afraid he was going to kill me. Now, Mrs. Wheel, let's be honest, Tom. I'm being honest. The medical examiner said he'd been dead for at least an hour before midnight, probably more. How can he tell that? Oh, we can tell, all right. Even if it was so. You know it's so. I do not. You know that he came home about 10 o'clock, that you had your fight then, that you killed him then. You know, it was thundering and lightning out. You know, that's apparently why nobody heard the shot. Now, isn't that true? Wasn't it around 10 o'clock that you fired that shotgun at him? Can I, can I smoke? Does anybody got a cigarette? Wasn't it? Yes. I have one of these. Thank you. That's all right. You like a light? Yes. Now, why did you tell us that you killed him about midnight when it was really about 10 o'clock? I don't know. Tom's trying to tell you, I guess. As long as I killed him, why should I try to keep it a secret? What did you do between 10 o'clock and nearly 12.30 when he came downstairs and told the officer? I just sat there. I just sat there in the room. I just sat there and thought about the 11 years I've been married to him and kids and the place we live in and being drunk all the time. His mother. I just sat there and thought about it. For two hours, you just sat and thought? No, not all the time. Sometimes I just sat. I didn't think. Were you worried that you killed him or sorry? I wasn't sorry. I wasn't even worried, not at all. I just couldn't think of anything that I could say to his mother. I tried to think of something to tell her, but I couldn't think of a thing, so I just sat there. For over two hours, with your husband's body in the next room. Well, yeah. But the important thing was I couldn't think of anything to tell his mother. I don't wonder... I don't see what there is you could tell her. The interrogation of Mrs. Weald continued. In the meantime, I had been out on patrol of the precinct. At 1 a.m., a fire truck responding to an alarm had collided with a taxi cab on Lexington Avenue, and two firemen were slightly injured. I had been out with the battalion chief of the fire department looking over the scene of the accident and assisted him in gathering the information he needed for his report. It was after 4 a.m. when I returned to the station house where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty as I walked around to sign the block. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Sergeant? Hello, Captain. Fred, what's doing? Very much, Captain. All right, bring them in. Oh, did they book that Mrs. Weald on the homicide yet? Okay. No, sir, not yet. Well, Lieutenant. Yes. Coley's on his way into the house with a set of keys left in the ignition of a parked car. Okay. All right, Red. Yes, sir, Captain. All right, Coley. Come on in with the keys. Sergeant. Oh, yes, sir, Captain. Have we got somebody on a fixer tonight over where that upholstery company fire was? Yes, sir. Underwood is on a job there. I'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind. You'll have to make inquiries over here, ma'am. I don't want to make inquiries. I want to talk to him, the captain. Lady, the desk officer will take care of you. The lieutenant. I saw a lieutenant upstairs. He didn't give me any satisfaction. I want to talk to a captain. You're a captain, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Mrs. Weald. Mrs. Isabel Weald. It was my son she shot. She shot him in cold blood. Well, the case is in the hands of the detectives, Mrs. Weald. I don't care who's hand it in. That lieutenant upstairs wouldn't give me any satisfaction. So I want to talk to you. What is it you want to talk to me about, Mrs. Weald? They wouldn't let me talk to her. They wouldn't even let me see her. Well, what's the necessity in seeing her? 21st she Street. She killed my Sergeant son, Waters. didn't she? There's an investigation in progress, Mrs. Wheel. That lieutenant had her up there in that little office upstairs, and he wouldn't even let me go in and talk to her. Well, you can see her in court tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, I'll be busy making funeral arrangements and busy getting those children, my grandchildren, out of that fresh air camp. In cold blood. And he wouldn't even let me give her a piece of my mind. I told him. The first time he brought her home to meet me, I told him he was making a big mistake to think about marrying her. Uh, Mrs. Weaver. I could have predicted this. I could have predicted it 
ten years ago that something like this would happen. Poor children. And poor me to raise the boy so that you could shoot him down in cold blood. Look, there's no use talking to me, Mrs. Well, Wheeler. When that detective knocked on my door and told me who it was, I knew something like this had happened. She was out to do this. You can just write that down in your little book. Mm-hmm. Did you tell all this to the detective? Of course I told it to the detective. I told them how he wouldn't go home from work. How he'd come to my house and I'd tell him that she was going to do this. He wouldn't believe me. I'd sit him down and I'd give him a drink and I'd tell him what she was like. I had to keep a bottle of whiskey especially in the house for him. In cold blood. And those poor children, the most gorgeous children you ever saw. He looked just like their grandfather. Uh, Mrs. Weald, it's four o'clock in the morning almost. I'd suggest that you go there, home and... There she comes. I want to talk to her. Now, Mrs. Wheel, they're going to book her. You can't talk to her now. I have my right. You don't have a right to talk to her now. I want to book her, Red. All right. Just uh, stand in there closer to the railing. Yeah. That's right. Beyond me how you can treat anyone like that with decency. That's a human being. Her name is Eva Wheel, Lieutenant. W-E-A-L-D? That's right, yes. I wish you would use your maiden name. Mrs. Wheel, if you don't stop interfering, I'll have to ask you to leave the station house. Three, one, four, five, first family. With my son, my baby, the baby of my family, that's not your thing, is it? Eight, thirty-one. You haven't been out for a meal yet, Kent? No, not yet, man. I'd like you to tell the captain why I couldn't see her upstairs. I'd like you to tell him what you told me. Go on, tell him what you told me. It's not necessary for him to tell me, Mrs. Wheel. You have no right to interfere and interview a suspect during the course of the investigation. I'll see what my rights are. Well, you'll be taken to the 19th precinct where they have cells for female prisoners. I don't care. She don't care about anything. And you'll be taken to felony court in the morning. In the meantime, you're entitled to have us make three telephone calls. There's me. nobody I want to call. There's nobody that would talk to her. All right, wait in the back room with us, Alan. Yes, sir. Right this way, Mrs. Wheel. Well, how do you like that? She didn't even have the decency to say hello to me. Not even the decency to do that. After she shot down my son in cold blood. The way she described it, Mrs. Wield, it wasn't exactly cold blood. No? I'd like to know what it was then. Well, that's up to the courts to determine. A lot they know. To kill a woman's son like that it was the same as if she'd taken that gun and aimed it at me. Just the same. It's a good thing you weren't there, Mrs. Wield. She might have done just that. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Sitting on a ledge where? A man or a woman? Yeah. Yeah. What floor? What floor? Well, if she threatened to jump? Yeah. Yeah. And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan on the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Written and directed by Stanley Niff. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives, Art Hanna speaking. 21st Precinct has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. This is Derek's O'Reilly Auto Parts story. After the third time jump-starting my car, I finally realized my battery was dying. So I stopped by O'Reilly to have it checked. They tested it right there in the parking lot. It was bad, real bad. But they helped me find the right battery for my car and even installed it for free. Now my car starts like new. Oh, 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 O'Reilly. Auto Parts. You always dreamed about owning your first house or driving that special car or opening that business. Unfortunately, you also had nightmares. Introducing the May Only My Good Dreams Come True policy from American Family Insurance. Insure carefully. Dream fearlessly. Get a quote. Find an agent. Visit AmFam.com. 
American Family Mutual Insurance Company, S.I. and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin.